Hey, good morning, everyone. Good to be with you. I uh, was hoping we'd be meeting in person today, but uh, God had other plans, probably for the better since we got the storms rolling through this weekend. Uh, but next weekend, we're going to be meeting, so excited to see everybody at the club next weekend at 1030. Uh, mark your calendars, and hopefully you can all make it for that. Let's pray. We're going to worship, then we'll come back. Got a word for you this morning. Uh, as we continue through this story of the Bible, looking in Acts and following the life of Peter and Paul and Barnabas and James and uh, all the champions of our faith, and um, just excited to share a little bit this morning about what God showed me as I was reading through this and highlighted for us to talk about this morning in these passages. So let's pray. We'll worship. We'll come right back. Father, in Jesus' name, we are grateful for your presence, and we ask that your presence would come into the wherever we are and uh, fill the room and Holy Spirit that you would come and fill us afresh this morning. We want to be with you today God and we long for your presence. We want to be near you and with you and so just come and, and uh, dwell with us wherever we're at Lord as we worship you, praise you for who you are and uh, just share our love for you through this time of worship. We love you so much. Receive our praises this morning. We ask in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen, Amen. Let's worship. We'll come right back. Lord, you're glorious and you're marvelous and you're worthy of our praise. We worship you this morning and we lift you up.
Father, thank you for our time to worship you. We just ask now that as we get into your word, would you just remain and Holy Spirit teach us the truth of who you are, what you're doing in our day. In your name we pray and everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Good morning uh, again. Um, don't forget that next weekend we will be meeting in person at the club in the Glades Ballroom. So uh, join us for that. should be a lot of fun. It's just wonderful to get together again and worship together. So um, we'll see you hopefully next weekend at 1030 at, uh, at Weston Hills. Okay, so we've been... Uh, I mean, we're just kind of working our way through the Bible at this point, and I don't know about you, but I'm having a lot of fun doing it. I hope you're enjoying the teachings. We've gone through the Gospels, gone into Acts, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, and we've just been talking about what God was doing in the history of the church, and uh, today we're going to continue on that um, front. So, we discussed... Um, a lot over the last few weeks about from the time of Pentecost where Peter begins to preach and teach and thousands are getting saved and then the persecution breaks out and Christians are martyred at the hand of Saul and then the, they're scattered abroad in fear for their lives. They're on the run because they want to maintain their ability to worship God. They're not going to renounce him. And so they go on the run. They end up in places like Samaria. Um, and the Samaritans receive the Holy Spirit. And the church is kind of like, what is happening? And then we catch up with um, uh, Saul, who's later going to be named Paul. Uh, and he is on the road to Damascus. And the Holy Spirit meets him. Jesus meets him. And he has his radical conversion to believe in Jesus. And then we see Peter with Cornelius and the Gentiles and Peter's preaching to the Gentiles and all of a sudden the Gentile church uh, gets saved and we've got this Gentile, uh, we've got this um, radical experience and, and the Jewish people are like, even the Gentiles, God, uh, God's saving the Gentiles. And then after that, we get... Um, like around in like chapters 11, 12, 13, kind of in that area, we see all these exploits. Um, a couple with Peter where he's thrown in prison and then miraculously released. We see Paul and Barnabas just on the road like crazy. They pick up brother Mark and they take him with them for a while. And they're all over the place. Um, matter of fact, uh, in Acts chapter 14, verse 21, just look to get an example here of how much traveling they are doing. It says, when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, and they strengthened the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed the elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them in the Lord in whom they had believed, and after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. Now when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia, and from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the uh, grace of God for the work which they had completed. Now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them, and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Now here's where the story gets good. Uh, because this big fight breaks out, right? We like, we like movies with controversy, okay? Here's the controversy. This big controversy and fight breaks out among the church leaders. Barnabas and uh, Paul now, um, he's referred, it, it, I think it's in chapter 12, it says Saul who was called Paul, right? So from now on he's going to be called Paul. But uh, Paul and Barnabas are on their travels and now they it's about to get good because they're going to run into some other influential leaders who have different opinions about what the uh, what what Jesus uh, taught and how the church should be acting right so uh, here we go because uh, it's about to be on now where I want to land today is on the topic of the tabernacle of David 
And some of you have, and we're not going to get into a full study of the tabernacle of David, David, but maybe more to how it applies to us today and kind of some things that I think we need to understand for our society and um, our application within our society. So um, here's what happens. In Acts chapter 15, verse 1, okay, this is right after it says they they came, they spent some time with those disciples, they reported all the good things that God was doing in the Gentiles. Remember, Gentiles are non-Jews. And so they stayed there for a long time with the disciples, and then look what happens in uh, Acts chapter 15, verse 1. And if you want to turn to Acts chapter 15, that's where we're going to spend most of our time today. Acts chapter 15, verse 1, and I titled this point, Jesus Plus, with a question mark. Jesus plus, and you'll understand what that means here in just a second. And a certain and certain men came down from Judea. So remember, Barnabas and Paul are staying with the Gentiles, encouraging the church. And then all of a sudden, it says here in verse one, <clears throat> certain men came down from Judea and they taught the brethren. Okay, here's what they taught them. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, okay, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So this was obviously a big dispute. Paul and Barnabas had huge influence anyway. I mean, they were out there, they were the ones who were out there starting the churches. So whoever these folks, these certain men from Judea who came down, must have had some influence also. They must have been an influential group of teachers who were able to, to convince or persuade the people that the Gentiles needed to be circumcised. Um, we see these kinds of influential folks pop up out of nowhere all the time. You see this uh, in inner office dynamics. You obviously see this in politics. Look at new senators, new uh, politicians of any kind who rise up on the scene and get the spotlight and start to influence people one way or another. This is kind of what's happening within the church. You've got Paul and Barnabas who are starting churches, who are planting and, and gathering, and there's salvation, and then these leaders from Judea these people, influential people, certain men, the Bible says, come down and they start telling people, you need to get circumcised. Well, what's the big deal? So circumcision um, was obviously a, a, a ritual, a practice that started way back in Genesis chapter 16, uh, 17, when God made a covenant with Abraham. Remember, God called Abraham out of his family said Abraham leave your place your land your family and go to this new place that I'm gonna take you to and I'm gonna make you a great people and nation and from your descendants the world will be blessed and so it was from a man that God then took a man who he had a relationship with and created really a whole new people group from and had a covenant with Abraham and part of his covenant was to say, Abraham, if you live with me my, and, and remain in my presence and, and um, follow these guidelines, um, I'm going to covenant with you and I'm going to bless your, you and bless your descendants and bless the hand that you work, that, that, as you work, and you're going to have descendants more numerous than the stars and all these things. And he said, one of the things I want you to do, Abraham, as a sign that you serve and worship the true God is I want you to circumcise every male. Now then, that practice becomes repeated again or communicated and repeated again in the law in Leviticus 12. And this physical sign of a true follower of God and the covenant that was made with God is then practiced for thousands of years. So I've, you can see why this becomes such a major dispute among the Christian church between 
the Jews and Gentiles, especially Jews who then converted to Christianity, believing that Jesus was the Messiah. They're saying, hey, you still need to get circumcised. And so Paul and Barnabas, they're going, well, hang on a second, because we see Gentiles, people who are non-Jews, who have not been circumcised, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this becomes such a huge argument among them, and one that they can't get quite figured out, and such a big problem and a big issue that they need to get this figured out and spread the word out to everybody. Now, the bummer part is they couldn't, they didn't have texting, they didn't have email, right? They didn't have Zoom meetings. How much easier would that have been to just get the council together and say, let's have a Zoom meeting real quick and get this figured out? Uh, I mean, think about what they had to do now. They, they said, okay, Paul and Barnabas, go ahead and start walking. Because you guys need to go to Jerusalem, sit down with all the leaders of the church, and let's get this fact figured out. Could you <laughs> imagine if you have the meeting, and then after the meeting, you go back to report what was said, and, and you forget a couple details, right? <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that. You can't just pick up the phone. Hey, what was that thing we said when we were talking about that one? Like, you can't do that. You, you got to walk all the way back. So this is a big deal. They're, they're going to send everybody to go, these guys to go meet in Jerusalem and have this big meeting where they're going to sort out this issue. Now, why is this issue so important? Well, it's so important because it was, here's really the crux of the matter. It was either you're saved by grace through Jesus alone, or based on what these guys are saying, you're saved by grace through Jesus plus the ritual of circumcision. And if that's true, then where else does it land? You're saved by grace through Jesus plus the law. You're saved by grace through Jesus plus man's work or the work of your own hands and earning your way. And this becomes the problem, because if they're going to say that certain rituals are part of the salvation process, then what other parts should be included? And so this becomes the major big debate that's going on. They're going, well, where do we land on this, and what should we tell the Gentiles? So then in Acts 15, verse 3, they continue. It says, so being sent on their way by the church... They passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. I kind of look at that as like, they're now on a road trip to Jerusalem, and along the way, there's a few destinations they wanted to stop off at. Uh, and so, even on the way back to Jerusalem, Paul and Barnabas, they just can't help themselves. They're still stopping and preaching and talking about the Gentiles being saved, and there's great joy and they're just, here they go, right? So then, uh, and when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, so here it is again, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. So this is a big deal. Here's this big matter again. It, the, the, when they get back to Jerusalem, there's more people there. The Pharisees who, be, who, who then believed in Jesus are saying, well, they need to be circumcised. And it doesn't stop there for them. They also need to keep the law of Moses. Now, look who shows back up on the scene. Remember, Paul and Barnabas traveling the world, preaching to the Gentiles. Here they come back to Jerusalem to settle this matter about whether Gentiles need to be circumcised. And while in Jerusalem, they, meet, they run into these Pharisees, and the Pharisees say they do need to be circumcised, and they need to follow the law. And now they meet up with the group in Jerusalem, and look who's there. When there had been much dispute, look who rose up. Peter rose up and said to them, 
So now you've got Paul, Barnabas, Peter, the, the Pharisees who believe. They're all here gathered together to try to figure this matter out. And here's what Peter says. Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose us, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between them and us, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Praise the Lord, right? What a statement. What a, I mean, that, that, that's Peter preaching his experience. We shall be saved in the same manner as they, Peter says. Jewish, Samaritan, Gentile, there's no more distinction. It's not by the circumcision. It's not by the obeying the laws, what Peter's saying. He's like, let me share with you my experience, right? Now, they would have all known this because this is like 10 years ago probably at this point, and we just read about this and preached on this a few weeks ago. Peter gets visited by God about a man named Cornelius who he's supposed to go visit. And Peter is shown, remember, the sheet that comes down with all the unclean animals for Jewish practice. And God says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter says, I can't do that. It's unclean. God says, don't call unclean what I have made clean. And it's in reference to him now about to go meet the Gentiles, Cornelius, and the people in his home. And he's going to go preach to them. And God's saying, don't call what I've called clean. Don't call it unclean. So Peter's prepared. His heart is prepared. He gets there. He starts communicating the gospel to these non-Jews. And right before his eyes, he sees the Holy Spirit fall on them. And they begin to... Uh, to, to speak in tongues. And um, Peter, in this verse, he references it by saying, Before my eyes, they were acknowledged by God. These Gentiles were acknowledged by God. Well, how did he know they were acknowledged by God? Because they received the Holy Spirit, who is the seal. See, Ephesians 1.13 says this, the truth is the good news. When you heard the truth, you put your trust in Christ. Okay? That's for me, for you, for the Gentiles, for the Jews. When you heard the truth, Jesus, you put your trust in Christ. Then God marked you by, or in some translations it says sealed you, by giving you his Holy Spirit as the promise. There it is. Now in Acts 10.44 we see how this played out. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. And then look at the distinction that's made. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on even the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. So the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles and they begin speaking in tongues and praising and extolling God. So they know this is real deal. And because they're receiving the Holy Spirit, who is the mark or the seal of the promise, the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ, they know that the Gentiles are receiving it. So Peter stands up and goes, okay, Paul, Barnabas, Pharisees, you've got this argument, but don't you remember how I went to the, these Gentiles, I was the first one to communicate to them about Jesus, and they received the Holy Spirit at that point. Their, he, and he says it this way, their heart and our heart are purified by faith. He's basically saying not circumcision, not purified by laws, not purified by rituals, not by circumcision, by faith in Jesus Christ. Then he says this, Now therefore, 
Why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? But we believe that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Remember, a yoke was the harness placed on an ox that would be attached to the plow. So the ox would pull and pull and the plow would be digging into the ground. And the harder they pull, the harder the plow digs into the ground and they would till up the the soil, right? And Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He took that weight. He took that burden um, of, of the rituals and the circumcision and the practices The covenant of the the circumcision then, the easy way with Jesus, the yoke that is easy, is the circumcision of the the heart, the faith in Jesus Christ. So what, what can we glean from this before we move on to the next part of what happens in this giant meeting with Peter, Paul, Barnabas, and the Pharisees? Um, people ask me from time to time, which things should I in the law be concerned about obeying? Which things should I be refraining from in my life? Which things should I uh, um, not uh, be involved in or anything like that? And I used to try to define that stuff for people. And now I think that maybe in some cases I was placing yokes on them. Remember Peter said, why would we place a yoke on them uh, for circumcision? Um, and by the way, side note, circumcision isn't bad in and of itself. It's at this point more of like a, uh, it's up to the parents. I mean, God is fine if you want to circumcise your children or if you don't or any, I mean, it's totally fine, right? Um, but we're talking about in terms of salvation, okay? So I used to try to define for people, well, you should not do this, you should do this. And in some ways, I wonder if I was placing yokes on people. For different kinds of things you know different topics get brought up all the time um, like uh, tattoos and drinking and like all these fringy things Um, and now the way that I I reply to to folks about that sort of thing is to say not necessarily to write this written instruction booklet because those are yokes uh, though they may be righteous in nature Um, and good things to refrain from or practice. Really, the important thing now is faith in Jesus Christ, repent for your sins, receive the grace, and embrace the relationship that you have with God to the fullest of your ability. Embrace the relationship. Receive the Holy Spirit. Learn to hear the Holy Spirit. Learn to be led by the Holy Spirit. Rather than being so concerned and focused minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day on what you should do, shouldn't do, law, circumcision, all these things. Instead, I would rather see somebody just spend some some time focused on trying to talk to God and hear God and be led by the Holy Spirit and develop that relationship. That's what he died for. That's what he's after. That's what he wants. And so the covenant that we have with him, that's what Peter, Paul, Barnabas, that's what they're trying to protect. They're saying, look, Jesus died so that you could embrace the relationship and through the relationship, watch the fruit of your life begin to be bore and and manifested, which is going to be reflected in, um, in your life of faith. And so... These guys are wanting to make secondary issues primary issues. We like to say that the primary issue is faith in Christ, forgiveness of sins by grace through faith. And then the secondary issues um, become the legalistic type things of do this, don't do this and everything else. That can't be the primary. The primary has got to be with Jesus, which then begins to affect you from the inside out. That relationship then God will teach you. God will show you. He'll put the yoke that he wants on you on you. Receive his yoke. Hear from him. Spend time with him. Learn to understand what he has to say. So then look what happens. So Peter just declares, look, I saw the Gentiles first. Then Barnabas and Paul are like, we've seen the Gentiles a whole bunch of times. And then look what happens. It says the multitude kept silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through men 
through them among the Gentiles. Paul, um, so, so Paul and Barnabas, basically, they're backing up what Peter just said. Peter says, Gentiles get saved. Paul and Barnabas now start backing up what, what they, they just said. Then look who shows up. Um, this is like the most powerhouse meeting of all time happening in Jerusalem. You got Paul, Barnabas, Peter, the, 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 uh, Apoth or the Pharisees. They're all meeting, having this big discussion. And then look what happens. And after they had become silent, James answered, the brother of the Lord, uh, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, James answered saying, men and brethren, listen to me. And he kind of just like hammers it home with what he's about to say. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the, so he's saying, Peter, Simon Peter, remember Simon's name is Peter. Simon Peter has declared how God first visited the Gentiles to take them out of the people for his name. So Simon Peter's telling you how he preached to the Gentiles, they got saved. And with the words of the prophets, and the words of the prophets agree. So he's, gonna, he's saying Simon Peter experienced it first. And what was he experiencing? The words of the prophets that were written. The words of the prophets, they agree. And here's the words of the prophets. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may see the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name. Hallelujah. Says the Lord who does all these things. So Simon Peter testifies how God is taking some of the Gentiles. And James says, even the prophets agree. Now, who's he talking about? Well, right here, when he says that God says, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, he's quoting Amos. The, if you look in book of Amos, chapter 9, verse 11, you'll see this text. So Amos chapter 9, verse 11 was prophesying a day where the tabernacle of David would be restored. Now, Amos chapter 9, verse 1 through 10 talks about a nation in crisis. Now, hear me. Hear this part. Talks about a nation in crisis. The people have become dull to God. They're sinning. They're not paying attention. And God's saying, if you don't change, judgment will break out against you. So verse 1 through 10 talks about this, this, this people whose eyes have become dull to their actions and to God. And then in verse 11, Amos 9, 11, and there's so much we could get into about 9, 11 and the restoration of the tabernacle of David and in like the end days gathering of Gentile and Jew and prophets who have even spoken about the significance of the World Trade Center issue on 9-11-2001 and what day that was in the course of our history of seven years and uh, God says that a, one day is as of a thousand years and maybe for another time. But Amos 9-1-10 for some practical application for us today. Amos 9, 1 through 10 talks about the nation in crisis and whose eyes had become dull to God, so to speak. And then in verse 11, he says, but here's kind of the emergency wake up call. Here's what's going to happen. In that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David. In what day? In the day of crisis, in the day where the nation's eyes have become cold, when their hearts have become cold towards God. I will raise up a tabernacle of David. Well, God can raise up, he can rebuild anything. So why is it that in that day, he wants to rebuild the tabernacle of David? Especially when the tabernacle of David was prior to the, this beautiful ornate temple. Why build the tabernacle? The tabernacle was simply like a, a shelter, a tent of sticks. And I mean, it wasn't anything amazing to look at necessarily, but here's what the tabernacle of David was. Remember King David, way back when in the Old Testament. 
He built the tabernacle, which was where they housed the presence of God with the Ark of the Covenant. And for 33 years, there was non-stop worship. Remember, David set up thousands of musicians and thousands of people who would tend to the tabernacle. And for 33 years, 24-7, thousands of people did nothing but worshiped, praised, and thanked God. He says, I'm going to rebuild the tabernacle of David. So is the tabernacle of David being rebuilt simply a tent structure made of sticks where there's 24-7 worship? Well, I mean, maybe that's part of it. I think that's a great thing for there to be 24-7 worship of God. But the tabernacle of David is much more. The tabernacle of David done correctly. Remember David. Who was David? David was a pastor. David was a prophet. David was a king. He was a politician. He was a father. He was a teacher. He was a warrior. When the tabernacle of David is done correctly, it touches every area of society. The tabernacle of David is to host the presence of God in your life in every area area. Now, obviously Christians should be pastors. Obviously Christians should be prophets. Obviously Christians are parents, and that's going to play out in those areas. But Christians should also be politicians. Christians should also be teachers involved in our schools and in the media. Christians should host the presence of God, which should then 24-7 be infilling the, the people and then pouring out into every aspect of our society, and we should be seeing societal change from it. When the tabernacle of David is working among God's people, it is 24-7 hosting the presence of God that leads to societal transformation, and boy, if we ever need that. It's what we need today. It's about the presence of God. It's about the Holy Spirit. It's the time you spend with Him. It's being led by Him. It's impacting our world. It's being the light. It's being the city set on a hill. It doesn't happen through rules and rituals. See, this is what they're trying to get at. They're focused on circumcision and rules and rituals and laws. It doesn't happen through the rules and rituals. It happens through what? Relationship. Hosting the presence of God. That's what, see, Peter is going, I went to Cornelius, I watched them receive the Holy Spirit, and now they have this relationship with God. Paul and Barnabas are going, we preach to the Gentiles, we watch them get filled with the Holy Spirit, and now they have this relationship with the presence of God. James is going, guys, this was prophesied thousands of years ago. That there would come a time where there would be a rebuilding of the tabernacle of David. And there would be this ability for the people to host the presence of God. And now that that would be played out in every aspect of our society today. <clears throat> this, is where we're, this is what they're trying to get at. This is probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, church leadership meeting, corporate, global church leadership meeting, maybe that ever happened. James, Paul, Barnabas, and what were they trying to protect? They were trying to protect the understanding that salvation comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. The filling of the Holy Spirit is the gift and the seal of that. And the developing of 24-7 hosting the presence of God in the life of every individual Christian would then manifest itself in society and we would begin to see world-changing efforts by Christians. I don't know about you, but I think we need that pretty bad today. My prayer for us today is, yes, live the way Jesus teaches you. Understand the commands of Christ. You know, look at the law, look at the Ten Commandments, look at all those kinds of things. But first and foremost, make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. 
Ask for the Holy Spirit to fill your life. Host his presence 24-7. Be, have him be so involved in every thought, action, and everything that we do that it would play out and be a transforming power in our life and in our society that the tabernacle of David would be rebuilt. That's my prayer. And so today, as we wrap this up, I want to pray that we would again be filled fresh with the Holy Spirit, that we would be focused on hosting His presence and that His presence would be with each and every one of us 24-7 as we continually pray and worship Him. God, thank you again for your love, your goodness, your faithfulness in our life. Lord, I pray today that we would receive your Holy Spirit afresh. Fill us completely with your Holy Spirit. Father, forgive us of our sins that we've committed against you and others, that which we've known and done in ignorance. God, wash and cleanse us by the blood of Jesus. Make us whole and right in your eyes by the righteousness of Christ that is exchanged for our sin. We thank you for the righteousness that we receive we're sorry for our sins. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive our nation. Forgive the sins of our family, our forefathers, and us. Lord, we want to be right with you, and we want your presence continually. And so forgive us and save us and fill us with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I ask that we would be a people who would continually be filled. We thank you that your presence is with us, that we have the opportunity to host the presence. And so as we worship you, Lord, transform the world around us and let there be societal transformation through the rebuilding of the tabernacle of David. God, we are so grateful for the grace that we receive. And so now we ask for grace, divine enablement to accomplish all of the things you want done in our own lives and everything that surrounds us. We love you so much and we're so grateful for all you do and for who you are. Lord, bless your people today, and as we go forward, may your presence remain with us, and may we see societal transformation. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you in person next week. Have a fantastic week.